In life, you gotta see things as it is, but not worse than it is. And if you see it worse than it is, you're doing that to connect with yourself, you're doing that to connect with other people, you're doing that as a drama queen or king. But also, you don't wanna not see it as it is. You don't wanna pretend like nothing happened, because that's bullshit. Second is you got to see it better than it is because if you don't see it better than it is, you're not a leader. Because if you don't see it better than it is with no compelling future, then what people do is just sit around. And the third thing is when you see it better than it is, you got to do something to make it better. At some level, no matter how small it is, every small action helps to make something happen. And I was encouraged this morning as I walked around to talk with people to see so many people focused on wanting to do something rather than just sitting and crying or feeling sad. And you have the right to do that. But if it isn't directly affecting you, you have to ask yourself why you're doing that. You could say, because I have so much compassion, and I'll buy that for a period of time, but if it lasts two or three or four or five or 10 days, then you better do this the rest of your life because there are plenty of people you could have that same caring for. I believe that caring needs to be reflected in action. And the way that action can happen is an empowering meaning. If I think you're indulging, I'm gonna keep asking you what needs you're meeting by doing this. If you're taking action, you'll have my total support. usually after great pain that people begin to make new choices or begin to appreciate things they've begun to take for granted like basic freedoms. This can truly serve. It's up to us whether it does or not. You must create a vision of something greater. See it as it is, then see it better than it is. And make it the way you now see it. That's what a leader does. They create a vision for more. Think about all the people that right now that are laughing and if you could absorb all their laughter in your body. All over the earth, there are people laughing right now. All over this world right now, there are people kissing. Right now. All over this world, absorb all their kisses. If you're gonna absorb all the pain, you better take up all of humanity's love too. Because otherwise, you're not picking a balance. You can't give strength to someone else unless you have it inside you. You can't give love to someone else unless you've given it to yourself, and you sure can't create an exciting life if the only time you can be excited is when there are no problems. Because if you're waiting for a time when there are no problems, and there's no pain, and there's no tragedy, and there's no injustice before you celebrate, then you're never gonna celebrate again as long as you live, or you're gonna have to focus only on a very small part of the world. Don't be selective in your caring, don't be selective in your pain. Create gratitude now. From that place, there'll be more of you to give. If you look for the good, it's always there. What's wrong is always available, whether you show it on the news or not. And so is what's right. Right now, there are children being born into a world where they will be loved. Right now, there are people being saved in hospitals all across this country. Right now, there are lives being turned around by people who care. Everywhere in this moment, life is brewing and growing and expanding all over this earth. Life always moves forward, it never moves backward. Children are laughing, people are achieving. If this was just one more event in your life, another piece of the fabric coming together to create more of you, the real you showing up, what would you decide to do? How would you decide to deal with tragedy? What decision could you make? Because in a state of certainty, you know what's right, not what I know, what you know. You have to make your own choices. We can all share our point of view, but you should make your own choices. What's right for you to do? How can you use this? What can you remember about humanity or about yourself? What emotions are available at any moment for you? What did you focus on when you first thought about this? When you first heard it, and you probably had several things. You focused on one thing, and then another, and then another. Is that true? And then as you focused it, what meaning did you give to that? And then, what did you decide out of that? Did you decide you have to be more careful? Did you decide you just have more faith? Did you decide to put things in balance? Did you decide to be more grateful? Did you decide to give some blood? What did you decide before we talked this morning? I want to know what, how you processed initially what you focused on, what meaning you gave, what you did in your head, what action you think you do. 
somebody's request, somebody's demand, somebody's interest, television, whatever. What will control your focus though day to day, even with that stimulus, is questions. So if when this happened, the question you asked yourself was, and your focus is like, oh my God, who did this? Then we know what's gonna happen. You're gonna move towards anger. If your question was, how could man do this to man? What's, what's humanity coming to? Then you've gone to a different place. If you went to a question like, God, I wonder how these families are dealing with that. You're gonna come up with a different set of emotions. If your question was, how can I really serve in this area? How can I help? You're gonna go to a different place. Your questions control your focus and your focus will control your feelings because it will move you towards a meaning. It'll move you in a direction. Day to day, moment to moment, it's your questions. What controls your focus throughout your life is your values. So if you value, for example, security as your highest value, I know this event is unnerving for you, right? If you value, let's say, making a difference, some part of you actually has maybe a sense of excitement about this because you know that these are the kinds of moments, these are defining moments in which you can truly make a difference in the world. Day to day, people don't pay attention. People pay attention when there's pain. People want help when there's pain. So it all depends on what you value. If you value significance more than anything else, you're pissed off about this if you're an American. Right? If you value certainty, you may be pissed off because you're afraid you're gonna lose that. So you get into anger as a way of overcoming that. If you value connection, you probably are trying to think of all the people you can connect with, or you probably called people you care about about the situation, or you shared it, and that's the highest thing you have. If you value variety, this is like, you know, wow, this is drama, this is terrible, but it's a little exciting for you. Because there's no bad or good here. This is about authentically knowing how you react to situations. And you might look at somebody and be upset they're not reacting the way you're reacting, but no one's gonna react exactly the way you're gonna react except somebody that's your exact model of the world. And if you limit your life to people that share all your same beliefs and values and rules, you better put yourself on a tiny, small little island with very few people. To be part of humanity, you have to appreciate all these points of view and then allow them, may, some of them may influence you as we talk about this. Because again, some people are gonna be in your group and they go, this is bullshit. People die every damn day. Oh now, because it's this dramatic way it's done, you're gonna be upset and someone else is gonna go, how could you say that? My family's in New York City, right? Or someone's going to say, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, this is America's payback for all the shit they've done. And someone's going to go, what? We do more things for the world? So this could be a really inspiring conversation. Or if you start to get hooked, ah, 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 if you feel yourself ah, getting hooked by something someone's saying, instead of getting hooked by them, you've got to realize you're the one who's hooked. It has nothing to do with them. Why is this bothering you so much? What is it that you're overvaluing for you to get this upset? Because you're getting that upset, something you're probably overvaluing. You're valuing too much. You're valuing it more than the relationship or the learning of the conversation. See if you can stay fascinated by the unique different ways instead of judgment about everybody's point of view. So, so the challenge is to keep doing the same thing that doesn't work over and over and over again. Retaliate, the other side doesn't understand, they retaliate back. The other side doesn't understand, they retaliate back. And so we have all this violence. And the violence is because of one thing. Because when people are hurt, one way to get out of pain is to get angry. Because when you get angry, you get certain and you feel significant. Because when someone takes things, you feel insignificant and you feel uncertain. And so anger is the way to return to that. But anger runs its course so it starts to eat you up and then people start to feel sad. So I don't have an answer for you on a humanity basis. I can only tell you the answer on an individual basis, that if you continue with the anger you've got, you won't be able to do this. And you're far advanced because you have the ability to have both emotions. And I respect you immensely for, and share them. I respect you immensely first for being willing to tell us the truth of what you feel and to show it to us. I respect you immensely because you also have the ability to have compassion because many people could not get beyond their anchor and say, I'd like to be there to hold somebody's hand. They just go, hey, they deserve it. I don't know them anyway, they're faceless. So your evolution as a soul, as a spirit, is quite accelerated compared to most people. But the, the reason you're here, my guess is, like why we're all here, there's a spiritual reason we're all here together. We're here for a reason. This is not a mistake. And one woman was telling me she's feeling guilty. She's so guilty because she, she, she should be back home to help other people. And I'm gonna bring a group of people up here so you can watch the interaction. And she's here because she's got that guilt all the time. The woman was angry, is angry all the time. 
This is just a new reason. These are patterns. All this event is is an opportunity for you to run the triads you already run with more intensity. So he gets to run the triads he's had of frustration for some time. She gets to run her anger. Somebody else runs their guilt. Somebody else runs their sadness. It's a magnifier, a massive magnifier, but people go where they live. And if you want to change the world, you got to change yourself and then your friends, and you got to go back and do what nobody else will do. I have not had your experience. I have not had my family raped, you know, by someone who stole my home and took it from me. I've had pains that I thought were intense, but I'm sure not as intense as the pains you've experienced or your family's experience. So I have zero judgment. I have respect for you, for being able to share what you have, and my only invitation to you, since I know you want one or you wouldn't have stood up, is to say, if you continue to make it okay to retaliate, even in your head, then you contribute to the problem of what was done to you. And so you got to somehow find a way. But in my opinion, if you allow that space in your head, which you have every right to have, then you're not Nelson Mandela. And people say, I can't do that. That's horseshit. Every person's a Nelson Mandela. Everybody's got it in them. Whether they choose to or not has to do with are you selfish or are you focused on the greater good? So for you, I don't have an easy answer. But I'm curious, do you think, if you, and you have every right to do it, if you keep that awareness, that feeling of now they understand, do you think they really understand? That's my first question. No. No. Then how can you, as one individual, make a difference? if you still understand yourself, if it's still a little bit okay inside of you because you understand? Or do you have to extract that out and go to the next level like Mandela did, which Mandela doesn't have one ounce of it's okay for that violence in him. He doesn't have one ounce of it. That's why he led a nation that couldn't be led, supposedly, and has integrated people that couldn't be integrated. And taken people who've been killed and abused and got them not to use violence. That's a unique individual, but you can't take somebody else to a place you've not been. Leaders have to go there first, and if you really live there, you can take anybody there. If you don't live there, forget taking somebody there. So either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. How do you do it? I, the question that I have is, and I'm not positive how, because I'm not you. The question would be, could I get myself to a place where I realize that I'm actually killing my own brethren if I make it okay for them to, even though they're justified, to feel enough justification to induce violence on others? Because then what I do is I am part of reinforcing the cycle that has destroyed my community in the first place. What would happen if violence disappeared with all these young people? What would, what would they do? Violence is a way for you to immediately have a mission in life, a purpose that's greater than yourself. It's heady. It gives you certainty to get in violence. It gives you significance. It's got variety, man. You never know what's going to happen next. Bombs going off. What's going to happen? What's going to go? It makes you feel alive. It gives you a sense of contribution to something larger. You feel a connection with the people that you're involved with us in. I guarantee you the people who are on that mission probably met all six of their needs in that mission. I guarantee you they felt a sense of contribution on a massive scale beyond themselves. They felt like they were growing to, to make this demand on themselves. They felt unbelievable certainty that they were doing the right thing. That they were finally making the payback happen. That justice was finally gonna be there. I guarantee you they made all six of these. Somebody who murders and somebody who sacrifices their own life to save another human being does it for the same reasons. Same needs. Just different beliefs about how to make it happen. So those needs that were taken from people are not being taken from you now because you're in this room. So if you live there, you got a problem. If you let your friends live there, you're part of the problem. In my opinion, everybody's pain is real to them. And no one will ever understand somebody else's pain, but everybody understands their own. That's the challenge. Everybody's is. And there's not a person in this world who's not gonna experience a ton of it in their lifetime. The only question is what are we gonna do with it? That's gonna be the question. So I don't know the answer. I'm not the guy who's wise about this, you are. But I love that you're willing to ask the question. Because if you ask the question, I know you'll come up with the right answer. Because you're seeking. My office was on the 101st floor of the Trade Center. And he and his brother owned the firm that were on the 101st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th floor. And he heard that message 
and called me this morning at 8.56 a.m. from the 101st floor to tell me that there was smoke in the room and an airplane had crashed into the building and he was about ready to lose his life and that he wanted me to know that he did love me and that he's sorry that we had to go through everything that we had to go through in order to know that we had to live in the moment and stop living in the past and mourning. I guess I'm just wanting to stand up here to, to, to remind everyone that it's important to let your emotions flow. Don't, don't bottle them up, but no matter what happens, not to get stuck like I did living in the past with that ball and chain so that you can't commit 100% to the present. What was, what was the lesson that, the spiritual lesson that's been given to you now with a giant hammer twice? You're a pretty powerful woman to handle this. You've got to live in the present and you've got to play full out, which is something that I've never really done. Yeah. And I've always kind of stood on the sidelines and utilize I think the worst experience can be your greatest asset. And in a situation like this, it, it has, these have both been my worst experience. I'm just so trying to utilize them to be my greatest asset to help everyone here if I can, to be more peaceful and, and to feel what you're feeling and to, to live in the moment and appreciate what you have, gratitude. Yes, that's wonderful. Maybe the additional one I might offer you that you've already thought of, but I'll just voice it. <laughs> Yeah, I thought of it, I'm sure. <laughs> is the love in every moment. Yeah. Not just play out, full out. Because, well, you say you haven't played full out and you've been on the sidelines. I'm sure that's true some places. I bet there's true other places where you really did. You're not being fair to yourself. But it's good to generalize sometimes in order to move yourself to action. But the one, the love, the unconditional love, the love without fear, that's the piece that was missing. Yeah. And what a beautiful gift you have is the most painful gifts if you can do what you've done, which I have to tell you, I, I cannot respect the person more than I do you right now. Thank you. Or send more love to you. I, my heart goes to you. I need that. You're giving a gift to everybody here. Because if you can find an empowering meaning in this and be such a beautiful soul and leader and get the lesson that makes you live more now and love more now, and if you can know what a gift you had to have shared a love many people never will share with this man and have you both know it, my bet is that if you knew it was going to end this way in advance, but I don't know, I'm going to ask you, if you knew you'd only have the brief time, but you'd really know you could have this kind of love, or you could have never connected with this man, which would you have chosen? There's no doubt I would have done it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a spiritual lesson in all your pain. When you get the lesson, you get to let the go of the pain. It's up to you to find that lesson. It's there for everybody. And it usually seems invisible to you because you're not looking for it. You're just staring at the pain and wondering why you got the pain instead of saying, what is it in my awareness, my thoughts, my beliefs that's creating this pain? Because there is a level beyond this. The solution I look for in anyone's pain, and anybody when I walked around the room here, is I'm looking for what I call the global solution. The global solution is that every one of us has something we value more than our pain. And when you think about it, and you believe your pain is taking away that thing you value more than your pain, you'll drop your pain and you'll move. You'll do something. People on the stage here are all from New York. They all had very different experiences. They're all on the same team, all from New York. They had very different experiences of what occurs. It, it brought up all of those feelings. No, this did not happen for the best. This is shit. I don't want to hear people saying that this, you know, this is something that happened for the best. This is horrible. It's horrific. And yes, maybe we can find meaning in it, but that's... We, we shouldn't be deluding ourselves into thinking that this is something that happened for the best. And what happened when we had that conversation? You still feel the same way? Has it changed? What's your mindset? You said that I live with anger and that I use it. And you're absolutely right with that. It is, um, 
a tool that I've used in, in, in very often in my own life for good. You know, I get angry about something and it's, you know, it's like it's jet fuel. She is certainly a rich enough human being emotionally to find other ways to get jet fuel. But I said, this is not the only place you do this. You've done this your whole life and that's grabbed her. And I could see it because this was a well-oiled process <laughs> and it is for all of us. However you've reacted to this situation, is a well-oiled process. If we didn't have this situation, this pattern was already in you. Do you agree with me on that? Yes, I do. And so it can get triggered again by this issue, but it can right. be triggered by anything because this is right. a way to feel powerful and strong about standing up for what you believe in right. and not letting injustice be there, which are actually really beautiful and tense. Right. But it gets used in other areas too, and it gets used in a way that sometimes is destructive, certainly to you, if not right. to other people. When I finally got through and knew that everyone was okay, then I just started crying and crying and crying and the tears just wouldn't stop. And what was really upsetting for me was I not only was thinking of the, the people that were in the trade center that were gone now, but the families that were home, specifically the children. We lived through, I lived through a circumstance in my family and, and the worst day of my life was when my uncle was killed at 43 about nine years ago. And it wasn't hearing that he was killed that was the worst part. It was sitting on the couch at three o'clock when his eight-year-old daughter came home and was told, Daddy's never coming home anymore. And I just imagined all, you know, the number was just terrific, 10,000 10, or plus, all those, those living rooms. I still wasn't certain that I could come into this room and play full out and, and get what I was here to, to really get and my hands were trembling and stuff. And from the back of me, I don't know where she is, but I do want to give you a big hug, was the voice of an angel who started singing, We Are the World. When everyone grabbed hands and I hearing her voice behind me, the energy was just flowing through everybody. And I just knew that it was going to be OK. You're probably seeing models of the world up here. You're seeing people who have learned in their life different ways to meet their needs for certainty or variety or significance or connection. And you can also see people who have valued some things more than others. So for example, very clearly for Stacy, the healing force is something she values more, which is connection. When she has the connection with everybody else, then she can now come up with an empowering belief system. Because the need for connection is there, and now the empowering belief system is, Yes, I can step up. Yes, I am. We can do this together. Those are belief structures that she has. I'm the director of neurosurgery at one of our trauma hospitals out in Queens. And I know what's going on right there, right now. I know what has to be coordinated in order to get the doctors in and all the staff in because we're on disaster code right now because there's going to be casualties. And I thought to myself, what am I doing here? And it was a literal question. It wasn't uh, figurative. I said, what am I doing here? I should be back there. I should be treating the injured. I should be doing what I can to help the situation. What good am I here? And I couldn't shake that feeling the whole time. I was just sitting there in our group, and I was just thinking that I'm I should be calling the Red Cross and finding out if they're having an airlift back to New York. Should just let me get back there. And part of me was saying, well, that's, I mean, what are you really going to do out there? You know, it's, you're not going to get there until tomorrow anyway. And I was having a hard time resolving that issue. What was, what was the emotion you were feeling? I was feeling guilt. I was really guilty that I was out here in a paradise and people were suffering back home and um, I guess this is an issue that I've been dealing with uh, a long time in my life especially in the profession that I'm in that I I carry around a lot of empathy for my patients and compassion and I really want to help people so I said this guilt is not something that's a one-time thing for you this is a guilt that's not all-time thing for you something that shows up a lot and she said, well, yeah. And I said, and the reason is she has a model of the world based on sacrifice. Her experience of sacrifice is ongoing. What she has to be able to do is her spiritual lesson is learning not how to not be guilty, but how to really love herself so she's got more to give these other people. How to learn that she's not the only source of everything. 
And if she can get to that point, then she'll start to feel worthy inside. And that'll change more than just how she interacts with her patients. That'll change her whole life. So my question is, how do you feel right now? By being guilty, how do you get love and connection? Uh, because I think that I feel that guilt will drive me to do more in order to... Well, why don't you try it? anger? Look at her. Now, by the way, do you see why she uses it? Does this have anything to do with the World Trade Center, yes or no? Yes or no? No. Did the World Trade Center have anything to do with what she went through in reality, yes or no? No. It was a stimulant. It was a stimulant for her to run her pattern. He ran his pattern. She ran her pattern. Hers is to cry and get sad. After first she connects with people, then feel really bad about it. But then eventually she can connect with people to come back whole again. Right? You'll see a different pattern here, and you'll see a different pattern here. Whenever you have a severe challenge of some sort, and you're having difficulty resolving it, remember, you're not going to resolve it with the same resources that you're trying to solve it with, because what you're doing isn't working. If there's something you're struggling with, like an injustice, or you don't know what to do, or you're frustrated, or you're hurt, or you're sad, one way to do this is to tap into other parts of you. Now, in social psychology, or in various forms of psychology, you know, throughout the world, people develop different stories, mythology, to help us be able, through stories, to learn how to deal with situations just like we're dealing with today. The problems we have of life and death, of betrayal, of coupling, of connecting, of the challenges that we go through with our children, all the challenges, aging. Mythologically, the reason that something becomes a myth, a story is a myth, is it's told so many times that the story is sustained for hundreds or thousands of years, hundreds or thousands. And so they're sustained because they have lessons within them. And in this mythology, there are archetypes. And depending upon which way you look at it, the archetypes usually show up in certain types. So we're gonna use four archetypes that are built within you, that are resources within you, meaning all of us here. So the first archetype or part of you that we're gonna talk about within you, the most, the fundamental one that most people will go for, especially in times of this situation, is the warrior. Now the warrior is a part of you that, think of the part of you that is probably the most intense, the most strong in its attack on anything. The warrior is about action and strength. The warrior is looking to do something, and they're doing something using their power. Okay? So there's a warrior part of you. There is a part of you that many of you would think of as a magician. Think of a magician as somebody who can detach from anything and just observe it. And a magician finds the magic in anything. A magician can snap their fingers and change something. They see things that other people get upset about as absurd. Because they have a totally different perspective. A magician just sees that it's all magic. It's all hocus pocus. It's all spells. It's all trances. It's all hypnosis. And the magician has a little bit of a whimsical view of things. But when the magician, as I jot him down here for, is, is that he's more involved in the invisible. He's more involved in intuition. And he knows it's easy. He knows it can be done in an instant. Whereas the warrior, how does a warrior handle it? Warrior's got to do it through strength and power and action. The magician might do it with a snap of a finger. The magician might do it by an insight or by the humor. Totally different view. Third one for you is the lover inside you. The lover, hopefully I don't need much description of, but the lover is really your deepest emotions of connection and love. This is where you vibrate with life. This is where all the deepest connections within you are. This is your connection to everything. To God, to yourself, to other people. The deepest love you have. A love that does not have conditions. A love that is pure. The purest part of you. The most loving, pure part of you. And then finally, the fourth part is the sovereign. And the sovereign, in mythological terms, is the person who really, he knows your vision and purpose. He or she. The sovereign is the one who governs has the ability at least to govern our lives. They know why you're here, they know what you're here to do. Think of them as like being a great king or queen who has just an enormous amount of wisdom and knowledge. They've been here before and they can command and they don't overreact. They know, a wise sovereign. Now all four of these parts are inside of everybody in this room, every single person here. However, they're not only in every part of us, but they're not always in balance. Sometimes who's running the whole show is the warrior. 
And so everything is reacted to with that kind of response. Sometimes who's always in charge is the lover. And if anyone is always in charge, it gets exhausted. Okay, so what's the question first? What's the thing you're struggling with that you'd like to resolve? That if you could resolve it, it creates pain for you or anger for you or frustration for you or it's overwhelming for you and you want to resolve it. The question I want to answer for myself in the context of, of, of today is this. I mean, anything you want, but I, I'd like I to mean, see it relating in the, the context. The question that I, that I struggle with and all the time um, is what is the answer to the situation? Okay, yeah. what is the answer to what situation specifically? Situa the escalating cycle of violence on both sides. How do we find a peaceful resolution that does not involve one of, that, that allows both of us to live in our homelands? Great. How do we find a peaceful solution that allows both of us to live in our homelands? Okay, that's, a, that's a question that he can begin to pursue an answer in. Okay? Now that's a large question because it involves things he can't necessarily what? Quit. Control. So now you brought up a great question, and you can pursue the answer to that question within yourself first, and then you can pursue it later on with Assad, right, on your own. But what I now want you to do is convert that question to why it's important to you. What's the real question behind that question? There's a real question relating to you behind that question. So what do you got to solve in you? What is it you need to resolve? Resolving what my true feelings are. I mean, when I said, you know, I was, you know, I sort of, you know, I, I, I sort of regret what I said earlier about, you know, I was raised in hate because I'm not sure uh, it was raised, but I'm trying to resolve, you know, what is it exactly that I feel? You know, cause, because um, I also, you know, when I look at it as a group of people, okay, is, re is resolving the, the group of, you know, the label we give to Arabs versus an individual, okay? Right. And, uh, I think it was, um, so much as Sad expressed, the, the conflict of, you know, I don't wish any individual harm. You have all kinds of things that are going on now simultaneously. So let's just come down to one thing. What do I need to do? I'll give you a question if I may for simplicity's sake. What do I need to believe, understand, or do now to take the situation and use it to make me a better person and somehow serve others that I care about as well? can't come to a positive side of this warrior. Uh, I can't. If you're asking for a positive, um, how I will use that. That's right. I'm asking uh, the warrior, because, not the dead warrior right. who's going to die because all he does is fight like a stupid ass. Mm -hmm. A warrior who has a purpose beyond fighting. A warrior who's really trying to serve a higher good. Not an asshole that was conditioned from youth. Not someone who lives in pain. A real warrior. Not a thug who calls himself a warrior so he can feel better about himself. A thug is out just to create violence because they felt violence themselves at one time or someone they cared about. That's a thug. A warrior has a higher purpose. This experience can make you a better person. Now you can share this with others. Take the message to the world and make the, make the message global. That's right. The, the, the warrior says, tell Tony to distribute the videotapes, the, the live video feed from these, from these events, to, to make that message global. Remember, the magician comes to a place of the humor of it. The magician sees the simplicity. The magician is not caught up like the warrior even slightly. The magician has a completely different perspective on this. The magician knows how to snap their fingers and create a change instead of having to fight forever to make it happen. The magician has magic available, and the magician is kind of playful. I'll turn you this way outside so you can see him too. Up here, it's hard to hear. Go ahead. Uh, the, the magician says, you know, uh, you know, just, hey, why don't we just, you know, play volleyball? L let's go sailing. <laughs> The, ma the magician says, you know, um, let's take a, a um, clean piece, of, a clean map with um, nothing but uh, latitude and longitude uh, without, without the, uh, with just the water and uh, let's just 
you know, create you know, the map the way we, the way we lay out this floor, th this room. The magician says, wouldn't it be nice if, and what if we could, and perhaps we can. By the uh, way, these phrases, the magician's offering, interrupt the entire pattern and create something possible. That's where the problem is. And that's where the answer is. That's it. The magician is so wise. The question for the lover is, what do I, Bernie, need to do today to take this event and make it the most powerful transformation in my whole life? Have me become better today because of this than I've ever been. And as a result, long-term serve all of humanity. My lover says, um, can't we all just get along? <laughs> Very good. The, um, That's good, my lover says. My, my, See the state change here? The, my lover says. Uh, my lover says, you know, love is more important than war. My lover says, Bernie, go home and give your wife a hug. My lover uh, says, Bernie. My lover says, Bernie Dove, a Hebrew name. Um, my lover says, says Bernie. My lover says, um, Bernie. Uh, Bernie, hug your friends, hug your family. Um, my mother says, Tell your mother again that you love her. <laughs> um, what does your lover say about Assad? My lover says Assad has, I'm sure, pretty much the same feelings. Mm -hmm. my, my lover says Assad has the same, the same kind of lover, the same kind of, um, is, is being driven by the same passions. The king says to Bernie, you know, choose your words carefully. And the sovereign says, speak only after great thought. The sovereign says, choose your, your emotions with care. And the sovereign says, choose your expressions. I'm wondering what is it that I feel that they're taking from me that is making my life less. So what if we made the question, what is it that I've been focusing on that makes me believe someone is making me less? And what could I do today to no longer ever feel less again? What is it that you believe they have been taking from you that makes you feel less? And what can you do today so that you no longer have to live in reaction and can become free forever? The warrior says, let's fight together. Who was he speaking of? The warrior says, who's to fight together? All of us, everyone. The warrior says, let's fight together in order to what? In order to do something new, to feel something new, to experience something different. And the warrior says we should fight together for what? For freedom. Of whom? Of our captured hearts and minds. Have the word tell us how. How do we fight together for our captured hearts and minds? The warrior says. The warrior says, puts your, put your swords down, take off your armor, and walk to the other side and look into the eyes of the person you're fighting. And then give him a hug.
Ask the warrior, how can a warrior do that when they know so much pain has been induced? So much hurt. How can one walk to the other side, look in the eyes and hug? The warrior knows, ask the warrior. The warrior says, show your cuts and bruises to your enemy and tell them to give you a band-aid. The warrior says, stop fighting and start healing. I'm tired. That's right, I'm tired. Warrior says, let's go climb some mountains and let's go cut some trees and let's go raft some rivers and swim some oceans. Yes, those are things warriors are made to do, but they don't have much time for them and all they do is fight. Warriors are people of action, people of courage. All those things are active use of the warrior in a courageous way. It causes the warrior to face fear and to triumph. The purpose of the warrior is to find within you a greater level of inner strength, not to fight with others. This warrior clearly knows that. This is a mature warrior, not a dumb kid. The purpose of a warrior is to break through fear, which is the whole reason for war is fear. A true warrior breaks through fear. They do it by training themselves in other ways other than war. The warrior says, Assad. The warrior says, Assad, your demon is tired, so you can chill. Your demon's tired, so let's chill. Ask your warrior what he values most now, because he's matured, obviously. What does he value most now? The warrior says, I value. The warrior says, I value inner power. Inner power. The warrior says, I value. Joy. Mm, very nice. What is it that I've been focusing on so much that it makes me feel like they're taking it from me and therefore I'm less? And what can I focus on, believe, or understand forever now or do It'll free me from this, so I will never again feel less than, nor will I have to force someone to know that I am more than. The magician says. The magician says. You're not having fun. <laughs> Find the passion. Passion. The magician says, smell the flowers. And yesterday we had a meeting, yesterday morning, it was, it was just a kick-ass meeting. And basically what we decided was, that we have to take this message one person at a time across the world. If we do that, if each one of us takes responsibility for what we feel inside here, it doesn't matter what governments think, it doesn't matter how many bombs they make, nobody can ever change what you feel inside here and there are not gonna be any wars and none of that stuff because we're gonna decide what happens. And what we're looking for is to make a fundamental shift in the way everybody feels, because that's what I experienced. I experienced a fundamental shift, how I felt inside. I was, you know, I'm standing next to Bernie and suddenly, you know, instead of looking at him as a guy on the other side, I'm looking at him as a father, as a son, as a brother. He's got a mother, he's got a son, he's got a daughter. And I'm thinking, you know, this is my family. 
no matter what I feel, even if I feel anger at him, even if I feel frustration at him, I mean, we all do, at our parents, our brothers, sisters, there's that love inside, there's that connection inside that no matter what, you know you can't hurt him. So, so that's, that's the outcome, to develop that conviction, that feeling inside here, so that you can't, you, you just have to look out for, for the other guys, good. No matter, no matter what anger, no matter what frustration you're feeling. And so what we came up with, came up with a lot of stuff, but one thing that I want to, com uh, to, to share with everybody is our, uh, our incantation. That's it, incantation. And that is passion and action for peace. Ooh, that's passion and action for peace.